August 12th. After several days of walking in suffocating heat, I wonder if I wasn't dreaming. In front of me is a monumental arch as high as a 30-story building. This stone cathedral, however, was not made by man, but by nature. Perhaps it's the gate into the Garden of Eden that I've been looking for. At the foot of Mount Aloba, Ingai has spotted a small cluster of acacias. At midday, when it's hot, the shade is really a blessing. It's the ideal place to take a break and give the animals some rest. Ingai tells his grandson that high up on Mount Aloba, there is still a small oasis hidden in a deep crevasse. There's a spring, palm trees, and they say that life is good there. However, nobody dares try to climb up. The mountain is sacred, and those who have ventured up have never come back down. The vultures are there, gliding along the dizzying cliffs. Can they see the mysterious palm grove from up above? I have to find out if it's real or a legend, and to do so, I must try to climb up. After days of looking longingly at Mount Aloba, I decide to go into action. I try climbing up, but I barely reach the halfway mark when I find myself face to face with a vertical, insurmountable wall. I have to retreat, but I won't give up. I'll make it, no matter how long it takes. After days of searching for a trail in the middle of the 400 meter high rock face, I'm about to give up on ever seeing this inaccessible oasis when suddenly I see a long gutter leading to the summit. I set up camp at the foot of the cliff. The next day, nothing can stop me, and I finally set foot on the plateau atop Mount Aloba. Religiously, I tread on the soil which perhaps nobody has treaded on before. I look in vain for the palm grove. Without a doubt, Mount Aloba is the realm of rocks and steep rock faces. There's no place for springs, enchanting valleys, or palm trees. The summit is invisible, drowned in a blanket of fog. I feel far from the Sahara. I'm discouraged, but my guide reassures me. He says he knows real forests hidden in the heart of the Enadai Massif. We leave. Ingai's caravan continues on the strange trails that erosion has dug in the sandstone walls. In the corridors of this gigantic natural labyrinth, a careless camel driver can wander for days or even be lost forever.
Ingai has warned Abderahim. The herd has to be watched closely in the labyrinth. A camel can easily get lost, and even trying to find it, given the fact that it can be found, is a waste of precious time for the caravan. Suddenly, Abderahim realizes he's missing a young camel. Ingai is furious. This is not the moment to lose a camel. If other travelers find the animal, they'll make it their own. Stealing camels is a common practice for the Bidiat. Before getting married, a young man must accomplish the task of stealing a camel from a distant herd. August 17th. I can see an immense patch of vegetation. It's the Bashikale Canyon. It seems to shelter a real forest. I can feel I'm reaching my goal. This lush paradise I'm looking for might be right here. In Bideyat, Bashikale means the spring where he slept. A long time ago, when Ingai's ancestor came here, he rested in the canyon and then settled here. Ever since, the canyons have been considered sacred. As a child, Ingai came here to worship his ancestor. Offerings are made to him, animals sacrificed, and prayers said to him. 
people ask him to protect the camels from wild animals or to find a young stray. Ingai has become a good Muslim. He no longer worships the ancestor, but he still believes in his presence. And he also believes that at Bashikele, his herd will be under the ancestor's protection and thus will have enough to eat and drink. Ingai wants to show the canyon of his forefathers to his grandson as well. At the entrance to the canyon, there's a jungle of doom palm trees. Abderrahim has never seen so many trees. The doom palm tree is usually found in the savanna, hundreds of kilometers south. Its presence here indicates that they are no longer in the Sahara, that there is water present. <laughs> Ingai and Abderrahim take advantage of their stop here to gather palm leaves. Once dry, they can be used to cushion the camel saddles. The Bidiat know all about the doom palm trees of Bashikele. Like the peasants of the savanna, the Enedai nomads have learned to use the big leaves and the solid wood of this valuable tree. The leaves are woven to make tents and the wood used to build houses. Contrary to desert palms, the doom palm tree does not bear dates but large nuts. The Bidia children love them. Hey! Ingai and Abderrahim go through the canyon by following a stream that meanders for more than a kilometer. A river in the middle of the desert, a vestige of the rivers which once flowed in the Enadai. Near the water, I find some trees I've never seen before in the Sahara. 20 meter high trees with dark, lush leaves. These trees usually grow only in equatorial Africa, 3,000 kilometers from here. Their trunks stick to the rock face. Their roots twist and tighten around the rocks like tentacles. At the foot of the canyons, the water prevents the caravan from going on. Here, water is eternal. It comes out of the rock from an inaccessible spring sacred to the Bidiat. Long ago, Ingai recounts, their ancestor was dying of thirst, but God guided him to Bashikele, 
where the spring saved him. And today the ancestor still lives in the spring, watching to make sure his children are never short of water.